great pleasure to welcome Hannah Cohen, who we've worked together over the years, and she's going to tell us about the management of, of pregnancy. Thank you, Graham. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So, um, for those who don't know me, which I think are many in this audience, um, I'm a jobbing haematologist, that's a blood doctor, and um, I have a great interest in antiphospholipid syndrome, um, including in pregnancy, um, uh, 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 patients who have pregnancy problems. So, um, let's move on. Right, so we all want pregnancy to end like this in every woman. But unfortunately, in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome, this isn't the case. That isn't always so, because yesterday, um, in my antenatal clinic, um, I was very, where we see patients after they've had their babies, they come back, and um, I saw three patients, actually, who had uh, antiphospholipid syndrome with a history of many miscarriages between them, and they all had successful pregnancies. So we can do it, but what do we see? So, pregnancy in antiphospholipid syndrome looks a bit like this. We see early miscarriages, i.e. in the first 12 weeks, and that occurs um, most commonly. Um, so, 15% um, of women who have recurrent miscarriages, which is three or more, consecutive miscarriages have antiphospholipid syndrome. And if we're thinking about sort of total numbers, that equates to about 6,000 new couples each year come with recurrent miscarriage. So that's a huge problem. Um, and what happens here is that time and time again, they just do not um, get beyond 12 weeks. We may also see late miscarriages, we may also see patients who've got um, IUGR, which means intrauterine growth restriction, which means that the baby simply isn't growing properly, and that's because the baby's not getting sufficient nutrients from um, the placenta. And we also see preeclampsia, where women have high blood pressure, um, swollen hands and feet, and can get very ill indeed, and can even have fits, and it can even be fatal. Um, and we quite often see premature babies in women with antiphospholipid syndrome. And last, and um, so distressing, we also see stillbirths. So it's really a very bleak picture. And what is really important is if we are treating women with these conditions, that we treat them early. And this is because what sets the scene for all these complications is what's happening very early on at what we call the implantation stage when the fertilized egg um, attaches itself to the lining of the womb and then goes in. Um, and, um, and it's here that we have to focus if we're going to treat. There's no point treating way up here. And that is such an important principle we all need to be aware of. So many years ago, when I was um, a child, um, we did this study in 1997. Um, I went as a new consultant to St. Mary's, and I said, I'm really interested in this subject, and Leslie Regan um, still has a very large um, clinic there where she saw lots and lots of miscarriage patients, and I said, let's get together, and we did. And we did a trial, and what we did is um, we um, gave women either aspirin, which a lot of women were taking at any stage, because what we also showed there was that if you give no treatment and you follow up pregnancies, only 10% of women had a take-home baby. And so we knew aspirin did some good and women were taking it, but we added heparin injections. And what we found, and we did this in 90 patients, is that with aspirin alone, about 40% of women had a live birth, but when you added the heparin, it was about 70%. And so that was a definite improvement. Um, so there's one group in which we wouldn't do this, and that is women who've already had thrombosis, because in such women, 
you've got to give them a big dose of heparin, uh, because here we were using quite a small dose. Um, so um, what happened subsequently is that there were obviously um, various trials, and then I think what I call the wilderness years, because for many years it was said that heparin, you don't need it. Aspirin's good enough, and there were trials saying that. But the time has come, because uh, now what's happened is that um, analysis of several studies, five studies, has shown that heparin plus aspirin is what you need. And one of the major proponents um, that was um, contesting our findings actually has recently published a study where they were using heparin as well. And the current guidelines say you need to use heparin. So that is absolutely the case. However, it doesn't always work because after all, it's only about 70%. What about the other women? And so we need to think of what other things we can use as well as um, aspirin and heparin. And I think here we are coming into um, um, a very interesting phase. But before I say anything about that, I want to bring this to your attention, what we call non-criteria antiphospholipid syndrome. And I think this is very important for all women who have antiphospholipid antibodies, which may come and go, for example, um, or they have the very low levels, which are said um, in the international classification not to be important, we have suspected for many, many years that, yes, they are important. And these women, it has been found, also seem to respond to the same treatment that the classic antiphospholipid patients do. And so we um, have been batting away with this for many, many years. And um, recently, a review got accepted on this subject um, which um, really, I think, means that we have moved forward with this, and now it is being generally accepted. And what we have here is the women who don't fit into that classical category. So women who have two miscarriages, um, I say unexplained, because technically you're supposed to show that the woman hasn't had a chromosome abnormality in the fetus, which has caused the loss. And we know that can happen. Um, that can happen quite a lot. And that is, in fact, the commonest cause of a pregnancy being lost. But that doesn't mean that antiphospholipid antibodies wasn't contributory. Anyway, that's how I think about it. Um, and so three non-consecutive miscarriages, late preeclampsia, because when we talk about preeclampsia and the current criteria, which I have to tell you are going to be updated um, at the Turkey meeting um, international APS meeting, which is next May, um, and um, I've been invited to be on that panel. Um, so, um, and then also things like other um, pregnancy complications, and then also things to do with IVF, because IVF now is increasing, and we know that if uh, patients lose um, um, their, their pregnancies, so either they have a miscarriage after IVF or even they don't get that far, that antiphospholipid antibodies may be implicated. And the same goes for the laboratory criteria. Um, we believe that less strict criteria are relevant for patients um, with antiphospholipid syndrome problems in pregnancy. Um, and now, what next? Well, there are treatments other than heparin and aspirin. So this is one, and Beverly Hunt um, uh, published a study where they showed that patients where aspirin and heparin doesn't work, um, they gave them low doses of steroid, and what they found is that whereas these patients had a 4% take-home baby rate, that went up to over 60%. So that's one thing. Um, another thing um, that is being um, thought about is hydroxychloroquine, which is pretty standard treatment for patients with lupus, um, but not so with patients um, who have got antiphospholipid syndrome on its own. Um, and there is evidence that this may be useful. And Beverly Hunt is leading a study, and I'm very pleased to be asked to be involved in that, um, called Hypatia, which basically is hydroxychloroquine against a dummy 
um, in patients adding that to their standard treatment. And I looked up Hypatia because I have to confess my ignorance, and she, it's a she, was um, um, a philosopher and a mathematician in the fifth century. Um, so, um, and the other thing is complement. Well, complement's there to protect us from invading infections. Um, but we know that antiphospholipid antibodies can actually trigger off a complement response, and that can actually lead to problems like miscarriage. And there's a lot of work suggesting this in experimental studies in animals, for example. Um, and there is some work suggesting it even in people. And so complement is something that's really of great interest. And um, I am participating in, a, in an international study where we're looking at the effects of a complement inhibitor, but not in patients who are pregnant at this stage. Uh, but nevertheless, we're very pleased the company has chosen antiphospholipid syndrome to test their drug out on because we, we never know. We may be able to get to pregnancy in the future. Um, so I simply wanted to end up with um, mentioning to you what Graham alluded to, the um, APS Action, um, which is an international group which has now over 25 centers internationally, um, where what we're trying to do is network. And so we know that it's hard to do these antiphospholipid studies, but if you collaborate, you can. And, and so we're all trying to work together to do this. And this was our last meeting in Boston um, last December um, or November. And um, well, whilst not all the important people in antiphospholipid syndrome are there, we are very pleased that quite a number of people um, have, have, you know, have, have got involved um, with, with this um, group. So I think I'll end there. So thank you very much. And, uh,